Clause 8 is part of IP Watchdog and sponsored by Herity, the go-to firm for the Patent 300 for patent preparation and prosecution. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others and leave a five-star rating. And now here's your host, Eli Mazur. Today we're lucky to be joined by Tim Pullman, all the way from Berlin, Germany. He is the founder and CEO of IPlytics, which provides software analytics tools to companies deal with standard essential patents, and was recently acquired by LexisNexis. So congratulations on that. He is also one of the world's leading experts on standard essential patents, and because of his day-to-day job, he doesn't have to pick a side, and he's actually able to speak openly about it and uh, kind of give perspective, his true perspective about these topics. And finally, he has his own podcast, The SCP Couch. Uh, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I actually have my own list for my podcast of people that I'd love to talk to in the future uh, and get around to interviewing. And I also have a day job, so I can't always do that. But you recently interviewed two people on my list, and I love those interviews. One interview, and I want to just uh, highlight those two interviews so people go check them out after they listen to this episode, is with Carlos Solarte. He's the top patent attorney in Colombia and uh, one of the nicest guys I've met in the field. And he famously won that injunction for Ericsson in Colombia. And the second uh, interview that stood out to me that I, I really enjoyed and I actually shared it with other people at my firm is with uh, Karita Gupta. I think her official title is a chief economist at Qualcomm, uh, but she's one of the most compelling voices when it comes to explaining the importance of standard essential patents. So uh, everybody should check out those episodes after they listen to this one. So Tim, thank you so much for joining Clause 8. Thank you, Eli. I'm, I'm super happy to be here on your podcast. And I have to also say I'm a big fan of your podcast, actually. Um, that's also how I reached out to you. So you have great episodes on there, too. So I'm really happy to now joining here and join forces and talking and discussing more about patents and, in my case, essential patents, of course. But thank you for that. Let's start about your background. You're not an attorney, but uh, how did you end up in this world of patents? Uh, do you remember we, the first time you heard about patents? Maybe we could start from that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a legal person, but I'm neither a technical person. So I don't know what a standard does, and I don't know how to read a patent either, right? So that sounds weird maybe, but I have my background is I'm an economist, right? And first time I got um, to ha- get in touch with patents and directly also with the central patents, to be honest, was during my studies. I did my master's thesis on a topic back then that was called patent trolls. I mean, today's we have other words for those companies, and many of those patent trolls and non-practicing entity cases went, were around essential patents. And that's how I got into the topic. I think that was 2008, something like that. Um, and, um, you know, as, a, as an economist, right, looking at, you know, markets and market structures and why companies behave and have certain strategies. But I didn't look at it as an attorney or as a technical person. First time you heard about patents, you were seriously, as you heard about patent trolls, topic that we discussed. And I, you were actually working for the German government, I believe, at the time, you mentioned on your podcast, they were interested at the time is because there was a new non-practicing entity or some might call it patent troll called IPCOM, which was suing Nokia, which was one of the world's leading uh, cell phone manufacturers at the time. That's a very interesting history because Nokia is now mainly known in the telecommunications world, in the standard world as a licensor. What is that? cycle kind of make you think about? Yeah, I guess it was very different times. I think, I mean, first of all, there were not many patent assertion entities or patent trolls around and having one in Germany was a was a special history to it. It was former patents from Bosch and the IP director, you know, opened up that new business, that entity. Um, I think that was an interesting case. No one heard about that in Germany before. And then the patent department of the German government was interested to understand these new developments better. Um, in the case of Nokia, of course, back then, Nokia was, you know, the largest smartphone manufacturer, not smartphone, but headset manufacturer, to put it that way. 
And most of the licensing was more cross-licensing. So they probably were also a licensor back then, but not in litigation. They didn't have to enforce their patents, really. Um, it was more, and I guess it was also more like a handshake deal thing back then. A few big players that owned most of the essential patents, and they all were also producing devices, most of them, or had some supplier relations. So it was a very different world, of course, yeah. Let's take a step back. I, I know me and you and deal with standard essential patents every day, but some listeners to my podcast and that was me for half of my career is uh, vaguely knew what standard essential patents are, but not all patent attorneys deal with uh, standard essential patents. Can you tell us like what's so special about standard essential patents? What are they? I mean, first of all, what is it, right? I mean, an essential patent is a patent that claims an invention that reads on a standard. So if your device is implementing the standard, you're using that patented technology. Um, and, you know, the interesting part is standards are developed in open standards development organizations. The main goal of a standard is to spread and that everyone is using the same standard, right? I mean, it wouldn't make sense that we have different versions of 4G and 5G. So we all want to use the same. So it should be implemented in as many devices as possible. So the standard in the end is, is, is basically to spread technology, while a patent provides monopoly to the owner of that invention. So when these two come together, is a special case. The patent holder, in a way, has to give up their monopoly. They have to license um, and provide access to the patented invention, but not necessarily, of course, for free. They um, can charge um, for a royalty, uh, which is capped typically by what we call a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory term. If you don't want your patents to be in a standard, you can also pull out, right? You don't have to have them in there. You can always say, no, I don't want to provide my technology to the standards body. That's also possible. But of course, the special situation is that much more companies use that patented technology because it's a shared technology. And um, because of that wide implementation, and because typically implementation comes first and then licensing negotiations come second, um, there is, um, you know, there's much more discussion and public debate about what a reasonable royalty is, how much you can charge. And I think that's what made SEPs in the past years so special, especially, of course, now, because SEPs are not only in the telecoms anymore. As I said in the beginning, the times 15 years ago, there were a big few players in the telecommunication industry that cared about essential patents. But now the auto industry is implementing all these standards and, you know, it's a much more industries are affected by or use, you know, standardized connectivity technology is a good thing. But, you know, now they have to kind of deal with how to license those patents. And that, that's what made SEP so popular in the last years. And you mentioned, obviously, about how you started your work in uh, related to patents, but you ended up getting a PhD related to standard central patents. How did that work kind of inform your views of standard central patents today? Or what was your kind of takeaway? Yeah, I think uh, back then we were one of the first to empirically estimate the phenomena of essential patents. <clears throat> and by empirical, I don't mean that we claim charted anything. Again, I'm not a technical person, neither legal, but we looked at the data of declared patents that are potentially essential. We all know that. And we looked at the companies who owned these patents. We looked at patent pools that were formed um, around certain technologies. And we basically analyzed where do we see you know, patents, essential patent um, phenomena, what are the topics, what are the technologies, how are they licensed, you know, are they pooled, are they cross-licensed, you know, we found out that in audio coding, like MP3, one of the biggest first pools, most of the patents were pooled in two big pools that was super successful, while in telecommunication back then, no pool really was very successful, most of the licensing took place cross-licensing um, or licensing out, and then the phenomenon of, you know, non-practicing entities or patents and assertion entities that acquired a lot of those patents and then, you know, enforced them more aggressively. So all these phenomena uh, on a holistic view of an economist, we looked at those dynamics and why they happen. And of course, also as an economist, you always think about, you know, how should the framework, you know, the regulation um, around that um, should work and are there things to improve or not to improve. So that was the major, you know, topic of my, my PhD that dealt with that. And I, I was able to travel a lot. The PhD was funded by industry also. So I went to all these conferences and, and listened then to practitioners discussing. And, you know, I got to learn a lot of the topics early on, very practically uh, understanding from those people who deal with that every day. You didn't just have that academic vantage point at the same time you were talking to the practitioners dealing with it day to day. 
which is always good, I think, for academics to do. But did you think anything that the practitioners were missing? Or did you hear anything in their discussions that you're like, no, no, wait a minute. If you actually look at this from uh, my vantage point, I'm seeing something else. Did, did anything like that strike you at the time? I mean, yes, of course, we did see especially differences in when you read, I mean, as a PhD, we read a lot of papers as well, right? And you have to look into the academic literature and, and those hypotheses there often did not match with, with the um, practical, basically, experiences. And it's always difficult because as many events, you also have a lot of lobbyists and they may present their views, which may be their reality, but what's the, you know, what's the holistic reality? So it's, you have all these different influences and you have to kind of get your own picture together. And since we were in empirically working, we try to always, you know, test hypothesis against data. I think missing in a way, I mean, of course, people who are in day-to-day -day licensing, they know the world. I mean, I cannot explain anything to them they don't know, but maybe different views and viewpoints of what could also work and maybe, you know, what, what could be done in the future. Um, and also with regards to patent pooling and aggregation of patents or defensive aggregators and all these concepts, I think we, we wrote some interesting papers that were at least considered. And when I look at the world today, most of what we wrote about is also so now, you know, coming more and more, not that it didn't exist back then, but I think, you know, patent pooling has increased or at least in certain areas, we now have pools that were able to gather a lot of patents together. That was back then not the, not the case for telecommunication, at least. So some of the things that we wrote about now are, you know, are, are really working also in the industry. Not that I did foresee all of that, but, you know, I think we made some contributions, at least with showing what the data shows. As you were describing your academic work, it sounded a lot like what your company that you founded does, IPlytics, in terms of empirically looking at information-related center central patents. How did you get the idea to start a company related to what you were doing? I mean, it was closely related to my PhD, of course. Um, not that I only got in contact with lots of people from the industry. Also, we got more and more quite individual demands on data, right? People wanted to understand patent portfolios better in back then in the 3G, 4G technologies or Bluetooth, uh, uh, DVD was big back then still. Um, and um, th those... Rec Can you just tell, give an example of like what, what kind of requests were you getting? Well, well, I mean, you, you, back then, you know, if you look at databases like Etsy, even though today it's hard to access it, back then it was even worse, right? It was, it was scans and it was, you know, uh, written documents. And we really took the work back then empirically and, and, and parsed these and created a database of declared patents. And we were really the first, maybe the only ones back then who did that. Um, but we didn't have a database and a software to give really access to. So we basically wrote kind of like, individual reports that we sold as consultants to companies and gave them access through that. Like companies wanted to just to know, I mean, simple questions like who owns most 4G declared patents? It was really as simple as that. And, you know, count those patents as to jurisdictions and tell me who is the owner. So is this like an implementer, a company that is thinking of entering a field or? Back then it was mostly the patent owners themselves. Actually, yeah, understanding what their competitors own compared to what they own was the major thing. Implementers, but I mean, back then also, patent owners and implementers were often the same company. But it's mostly parties who are interested in licensing their portfolios. They were kind of trying to see, like, how does their portfolio stack up? No pun intended. How does their portfolio stack up to the other patent portfolios, that kind of thing? Exactly. And it was also, I mean basic, you know, kind of monitoring competition and building portfolios, IP portfolio managers were interested. So um, those kind of things, but also the licensing world, of course, trying to understand in which, which areas did patent pools work. We made analysis on how many licensees do certain pools have compared to others in certain technologies they have thousands and others only hundreds. Those kind of analysis were interesting for, you know, also patent pools and licensing organizations. Also there we had some projects. So that was the beginning of getting started, right? To have first interest in that data. And, and um, of course, but when you, when you touch data and you sell it as a report, you always end up with the same problem. Your data is outdated the minute you send it. It's not maintainable. It's not, you know, and, and also we, we found that we're dealing with very, you know, knowledgeable people and they come back with millions of questions and then you have to go back to the data and look at it. And it's e actually easier if you give them access to the data and they have a nice and convenient way to, you know, 
refine it themselves and um you know because they are typically subject matter experts and so the idea came up hey how can we get provide access to that data to those companies not through excel spreadsheets and you know reports but through a you know professional maintainable database that has connections to worldwide patent offices to give you know up to date information on that combined with declared patent information pooled patent information you know, eventually even litigation cases. And that's really when we started to build a prototype and, you know, put that data together with APIs and, you know, presented it to our first consulting clients and then build it from there, really. I mean, the first customers are always the ones that help you to build something and, um, you know, give you feedback. And that's really how we did it. I'm sure some of your initial clients were used to that white glove service of, you know, just being able to call your email you and saying, this is what I need, this is the data, just email it to me, and that's the easiest way to access it. Was it hard to convince some of them, no, you're going to have to learn this new tool, and it's going to be better for you in the long run if you kind of are able to do that on your own? I think the transition when you're building a software company is always more smooth. I mean, in the beginning, they call me and they want this particular data, and we try to use our tool together with them to solve it, or we use our tool to do it for them or something like that, right? So that that they use the software without us interacting. I mean, even today we help, we have to help customers to get them started and train them on how to use a software tool. But um, that is a transition, right? In the beginning, I mean, even we had issues with using our own tool, right? And which is good, right? You find out what is working and what isn't. So that is all a transition of how things work. So the, the first years were always a combination of software and um, let's say managed services around that data and software. You know, another thing that I see a, a phenomenon around like legal tools in the space is that sometimes you're able to convince somebody to use a tool and they use it, but then if they don't use it every day, they forget about it and then they don't want to relearn how to use it. Did you run into that? Of course, I mean, with any software, and we are a subscription-based software, um, engagement with the product and the data and our software solution is important. It's, it's, it keeps the um, usage healthy. And we have many ways to um, you know, engage and keep engaging our users. Um, we have a, now, nowadays, we have a super professional success team that the only thing they do is engage our existing customer and make them and keep them happy. But also we have more and more topics and content that we produce. Like, for example, we also have regular webinars that we do where we show with our software, you know, new features or how to, you know, get certain answer, questions answered with the software. And then we bring that and we publish it as a report and we bring that in the software and then, you know, users can look at it and can reproduce it in the software and get the data from there. So we try to do a lot of things to engage people. But with, with I think with any also, let's say IP software tool, IP analytics tool, what we are, um, keep engaging your clients and users is one of the most important parts because it's a, it's it's a business with you know where you have um, you know a, a user and often accounts with several user seats where you want to make sure they're all using the the software at at its best, right? You mentioned that, I'm, that you had some initial consulting clients who kind of became your customers of these tools that you were building. How do you convince them? sign up to this new product, how does it benefit you? And specifics of like, what is the win of using IPolytics versus blindly doing it? Sure. I mean, I think selling in a, in a space, in an industry with very well-educated people that typically all have high degrees and high positions and probably a lot more understanding of SCPs that I have always had, it was always a challenge. I have to say that, um, convincing those people. But on the other hand, no one typically has in-house a professional maintainable database of the data that we provided. And if you want to work professionally, um, we were able to convince people to use a software that really provides you all the data in one place. Um, many of the large companies had their own databases, right? They built their own solutions, which in some in some ways works, but it also always has limits. And the reason is because those you know, systems have to also be maintained and there has to be a product owner uh, doing that. And often in these bigger companies, at some point, there's less budget for that. And then, you know, that stopped and the users still want to use it. But then, you know, it's not providing, um, you know, the accuracy and completeness anymore. So um, we always, you always go up against those those structures. And of course, also in, in that space, sometimes very conservative people were used to doing it 
manually and doing things like that. But also that is a transition. I think the good thing is with a online-based software tool, I could give you an access now to iPolitics. I can give you a, uh, we even have an online um, tool that walks you through the first steps. Um, you can try it out. You can test it. You can feel it. You can look at it all, you know, in a, in a trial access, all for free. And then you really know what you're subscribing, right? It's nothing, you, you're not blindly buying some software. You can really use it and you can test it. And, and I think that helps typically users to see, okay, this is really helpful. Um, and this can, you know, increase and improve our processes and, you know, sometimes even communication between patent and standards departments. And, you know, in, in the end, you know, it, makes the business better. I think that's the goal of any software. And can you just give an example of like what is the common use case where somebody uses IPolytics on a day-to-day -day basis? I think our typical user persona is a patent portfolio manager who optimizes their portfolio, which, you know, they're managing their own patents that are potentially essential or not um, in the different technology areas. It's not all 3G, 4G, 5G. It's also Wi-Fi, video coding, audio coding, other standards. We have 25 different sources of standards data. Um, the, the other um, user group are the licensing executives, the deal makers. They have to make sure, you know, they have the right portfolio that they license, maybe a different portfolio that they want to sell, and another portfolio they keep by themselves. Um, and then the other side of the table, of course, the licensees who have to kind of get transparency on who owns what, um, getting an understanding what I'm offered is, is that, you know, is that a friend license? Um, but also if you look at the auto industry, for example, more and more, they are engaging as well. They have declared patents now. They go to the standards meetings. And we also, for example, provide access to the contributions and meeting data. Um, and also there we have users in the standards, you know, strategic standards space that organize their teams to see where, who is participating in what meetings and better being able to understand where to align and, you know, you know, basically the company strategy aligned that with the standardization strategy, aligned that with the patent prosecution strategy. Um, you know that yourself as, as a patent attorney, it's not always easy and sometimes data helps to, to get that all in one place. Your tools are being used to strategize for those standard meetings, which I'm sure is a <laughs> is a very I, I I think we could probably talk a whole podcast episode about the whole strategy behind that. I get a, approached, I guess, all the time by people who have ideas about different tools, software tools related to patents. They're super excited, and then usually they just disappear because I, I'm guessing they couldn't find enough customers or wh whatever happened. I mean, do you have any advice about thinking about starting a software company related to patents about whether it's realistic and what are the first steps they should take? I think, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long road and it's, it's tough. You know, you always get slapped in your face. I mean, you, you never, it never goes without roadblocks. I think that's for sure. I think the major importance is you have to think about what actual problem your software is there to solve. And your own value proposition, how valuable is it to the user, really, right? I mean, I had so many people that looked at the software and said, that's great, it looks awesome. But, um, and, and everyone was happy, but no one bought it, right? No one subscribed to it because they didn't have a problem to start with, right? And at, at, at the beginning, you're all excited, as you say, and you go out and, and you have this shiny interface and it all looks good and it's fast and it's super nice, but no one is subscribing because you're approaching people, they don't have a problem. They're always excited about new things, maybe, um, but they don't have a problem. So identify the problem, the pain point. And if you have that problem and pain point where people really struggle with, then you have to define and develop your value proposition around that problem and focus on that. And I think what we did in the beginning, for example, we didn't focus. We thought we could, you know, we could solve everything. We could be a search tool, an analytics tool, a patent management tool, like, you know, all in one place, a Swiss army knife. But that typically never works, especially if you have two people <laughs> and, and start a company. So focus on one problem, solve that really good, get your first three, four, five, ten customers, Create revenues. That's your that's your proof market proof. Yeah, I mean, and, and and we at some point, of course, we got also venture capital invest investors, which help, right? I mean, of course, the first customers we bootstrap, but at some point, you have, you know, if you want to solve more complex problems, you have to have more people. So we convinced venture capitalists to invest. I think now they're happy, and um, 
and and we had several investment rounds, so we had the chance to grow faster than we would naturally do, right? With with venture capital, so that really helped to, you know, get get momentum. That's great advice about finding an actual pain point, because now that I'm thinking back about some of these solutions, it's when they present them to me, like you said, it's a great interface, but it's like, okay, cool, but uh, it never occurred to me <laughs> that I need a software tool for this or it'd be used. And people are so busy in their day-to-day work, they're not going to be creating new problems just so they can solve your uh, use your tools. So I think that's... Uh, very, very good advice. I know you mentioned you're not an engineer or, a, or an attorney, and you don't write claim charts, for example, you don't prepare claim charts, but is there anything else that you're talking to your existing client base that stood out to you about a demand for any other pain points that uh, in the standard central patent space and what's realistic of solving it? Do you think one day chat GPT can automatically generate claim charts or something like that? What do you think is yeah, I mean, of course, the, the claim charting and knowing what's essential and what's not is, of course, a big question. Um, I think it would be, um, I mean, automatically creating claim charts, we're, we're not there yet and it's it's too complex. And we all, you know, I have never been able to read claims and sections of standards, I have to say that. But I had interviewed a lot and, you know, you, you would probably confirm that. Often it's so abstract and you have to have so much background knowledge to know if those map or not. Right now, through through simple semantics, um, um, it's hard to to claim chart. Um, but of course, software can still help to maybe pre-sort um, certain patents. Or what we would we say we have a we have a certain semantic mapping of claims to sections. Where we say um, this is not claim charting, obviously, but it helps you to filter out patents that have been declared that are unrelated to the standard, right? And that can cut, like, um, you, you look at a portfolio of a thousand patents, it can cut it by half or even more, um, take out patents that you don't even have to look at, right? And some companies start really with large portfolios and they don't know where to start. And software can maybe help them to say, okay, we can at least sort, as to our indicator, these are the most likely claims and sections that you may want to look at. And then you know, subject matter experts come in and do the actual claim charting, but they there was some, you know, work done that cuts down you know, the workload in a certain extent. It's not related to technology, but the point you make about how complex it is, these standard stuff and claims, you know, I have experienced sometimes, you know, lead, talking to some of the you know, world's leading experts in telecommunication, but unless they worked on that specific narrow slice of innovation related to even within 5G, they might not know what's going on in, <laughs> in a neighboring slice. Yeah, so it's an extremely complex uh, problem. You know, I want to talk to you, obviously, you're an economist. And, you know, standard central patents, and uh, to tell me if you disagree, but they solve the problem of incentivizing innovation, right? So uh, a company is going to invest billions of dollars in coming up with the, the technology for this new standard. And standard central patents basically is the way how they're going to get a return on their investment. I mean, taking a step back, obviously, this is the system kind of the patents existed before standard central patents. But, you know, as an economist, do you think that is the ideal structure, the patent system? Or if, if you had to start from scratch, do you think kind of there's a different way? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's, of course, a big question. And um, there's a lot of good, actually also empirical papers on that, right? There's, I remember some historians, they looked at, I think it was in Italy, I think first patent systems in Italy were brought up in one village and not in the other. And then they looked at how many goods were sold that were patented and not, and you know, how the innovation flow. And there, there's all these different kinds of findings there. I think what I always have a problem with is the same like, are SEPs good for standards or not? is that it really depends heavily on the industry, how that is structured, and the technology. Even in standards, we have royalty-free standards. Um, like, for example, IETF or W3C, they're, they're, they're standards that are subject to it, patents, their central patents exist, but most of the members say they're royalty-free. So licensing and the royalties is not part of the game. They all innovate, they all participate in standards development, and it works perfectly. In that particular industry, it works. In telecommunications, we have essential patents and they're not royalty-free, right? And is it because of the cost of innovating is much lower? I think it's the benefit what you get out of standard setting. It's different, right? I think um, 
you know, and, and I think we have um, companies in telecommunications, which I found is interesting, that don't sell any products and components, but they still contribute and innovate. Um, and I think the where you make revenue from standards development outcomes is different, right? Some companies sell products and, you know, um, companies like Apple are also standards developers, but they don't want to make money with their SEPs. They just use them defensively. But, you know, their main interest is selling more iPhones and iPads, right? I mean, I can get that, right? That's their market. That's a major market. Um, other companies like Orange, they are selling subscriptions to the network. They don't care about SEPs that much either, right? I mean, the main revenue comes from somewhere else. But then there are these companies that focus on producing technology and they they need revenues from royalties as it, reinvesting that into the technology you know the way you describe it is i, I mean uh, like the examples you gave apple and orange they'd be happy if there was no cellular innovation based on their bottom line right that's not but still be selling smartphones, kind of, right? I, I would at least say they they wouldn't mind to not get any money out of their SDPs, right? Um, that's not their major interest, right? Um, I, I mean, I don't think Apple would be happy to have no patents at all, right? <laughs> I mean, they use their patents also. Um, but, um, you know, in that particular standards development case, they, they wouldn't mind to say everything is royalty-free. I mean, keep patents, but this, it's royalty-free. Um, and other companies, they, they need the royalty income and they reinvest, you know, the royalty into it. Um, so I think it's those business, different business models in different industries that really matter, that make an economy work or that make, make markets work. I think in the end, if the price is right, if it's really reasonable and fair, I think it's perfect. It's, it, there's nothing against it. If there are certain prices that are monopoly prices that are too high, that are somehow, some people would call it pressured by whatever litigation, then that's not ideal as an economist, I would say. Um, then there is, you know, then there's monopoly prices that should not happen. But if that is not the case, and if we have a regulatory framework that makes sure prices are reasonable, I think there's, there's nothing bad about SEPs. That's uh, good to hear. <laughs> so that's SCPs in general, but you know the process of how these companies have to operate, and I'm talking about the innovators. It's it's difficult, right? So they have to kind of invest billions in research and development. They have to then file patent applications. Then they have to be, as we mentioned, involved in these standard setting processes. Then they have to kind of prove that what we call these claim charts that what they actually invented and they know they invented it right <laughs> like nobody else did they're, they're the ones prove that actually what's in the standard is what they invented it and then they have to go through the licensing negotiation and possible litigation so i think you said you know the, as a whole the standard essential patents it, it can work and works well what about that process itself within that any thoughts about simplifying that or is it does it have to be that kind of complex and difficult i mean i think it's 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 how it works i guess i mean we we're trying to support to manage that more easily you know connecting the dots between standards development work like looking at contributions that you submitted comparing that to your provisional filings, comparing that where the standard goes and where the, the patent application goes and managing your portfolio more, you, and optimize that. It, it is definitely a complex process and it's um, definitely not given that anyone gets an SEP just because they're involved in standards development. You have to strategically align all these different departments together and invest a lot of money. Um, and I think, and, and, and you have to invest it in the future, right? I mean, today standards are developed that you may not be licensing directly tomorrow right? Um, Long-term R&D even goes to 6G now that you're investing today that you will only get, you know, licensing income in, in a few years' time. But um, I think the system shows and the licensing contracts that are enclosed um, and the money that they make through the revenue that it's still a very profitable business, right? All these companies are still there. No one goes bankrupt. You know, they all still make good money from it. So it works, even though it's a hard way and it's not easy and they really have to innovate. Um, it is it is still um, profitable. Um, and I think thinking about connectivity in the future and how much more dependent all 
devices and also cars will be on connectivity. I think we're st still at the very beginning. I mean, cars today are a little bit connected, I would say. You know, I can open my car with my smartphone. That's crazy. But, um, you know, not, beyond that, it's some navigation system, some communication to a, to a charging station, maybe if you have an electric vehicle. But if your car is driving autonomously, the amount of data that is transmitted to compare to your smartphone is hundreds to a thousand times of that, right? And thinking about that, data stream needed for that kind of applications, I think the vehicle of the future will be consuming much more of connectivity as, as a smartphone will. And when we reach that level, I think then, you know, I think those companies will have even a more lucrative business to look at. Maybe another way to put it in a statement against interest. What I'm thinking of is, do these innovators have to spend way too much money on lawyers? <laughs> and, you know, I don't know, maybe proportionally it's not that big, but it is a large amount of money that a lot of difficulties, a lot of the executive's time goes about thinking about these issues, which all could be invested in innovation, right? All this friction that, is, is there any way to avoid this friction be, or reduce this friction in the process? We, we, are, we, are, we as economists, we call that transaction cost, right? Um, uh, I mean, reducing transaction costs just you know, not, not saying all patent pools are great, but patent pools is, from an economist's view, the best way to reduce transaction costs. Also not bad in terms of transaction costs. Um, as a legal person, you may have something against it, but if you also would aggregate the licensee side of things, thinking about aggregators like RPX, they uh, had a deal with Sysvel a couple of years back. So from an economist viewpoint, that was great. Like, Sysvel, you know, joined all the patent owners together, RPX, the licensees, and they had one contract. So I think if you multiply all these contracts, they published that back then, thousands of contracts saved, no lawyers, but just for one contract. So that would really save transaction costs. Um, on the other hand, if you look at litigation, I mean, that Apple and, and Ericsson litigate for years. I mean, this is probably one of the largest SEP holders in the world and the largest smartphone manufacturers in the world. And there is so much money at stake. Um, you know, comparing it to the size of the deal, as you say, it's probably also not too much. Um, and I don't feel that litigation goes into weird ways. There is a lot of litigation, yes, but you know, I think we always have to compare it against, you know, what's what's going on. I think Overall, what could be more efficient that there is more agreement, of course, now with new industries coming in. I think the auto industry is still quite, you know, um, not at, not there yet. Or, I mean, from both perspectives, there's not yet agreement on what's a fair price. And um, I think in the auto industry, the amounts of money are, are much less than in, in smartphone, at least yet. So um, I think there it's not yet optimal, I would say. Um, you know, it takes years. I mean, if you look at the litigations, it's like almost 10 years they started negotiating. And then after 10 years, the licensor gets their money. That's not good. But also for the licensee, it's a lot of unknown factors. And, you know, uh, they have to, they have a lot of risk there. Um, so I think that's, that's yet, you know, especially as no, those new industry verticals, I'm more worried about those transaction costs and risk that are in the market that still exist and where it's unknown how much you have to pay from the perspective of a licensee, but also the perspective from a licensor. It's unknown if you get your money at all or, you know, if someone leaves the market again. We've seen that this year. Um, so, you know, it's, you never know what happens, right? And that's, I think, from both sides, it's, it's, it's a difficult um, situation um, to solve. At a high level, you know, standard central patents, you seem to think work pretty well. You have to expect these kind of transaction costs, and it's not perfect, but it works out. But I want to talk, obviously, it's a growing market. I think it's $15 trillion or whatever, just in telecommunications. And obviously, there's a lot of people trying to make money <laughs> off of this. And they almost introduced new friction to this, and I want to get your thoughts about them. One of them is... Uh, well, I think they're worldwide, but Unified, for example, right? These uh, implementers that you mentioned, they have their companies who try to be their quote-unquote allies, and what they do is make life more difficult for uh, innovators, maybe from an innovator's viewpoint. I mean, what do you think about the role like that? That Unified says there's a lot of bad center sessional patents, implementers are paying way too much, and it's going to be our job to radically challenge them to prove that's the case. What do you think is their role? 
I mean, I think, um, I mean, there's, of course, the big lobby on both sides, right? And Unified is, has built their whole business model around um, the lobby of the licensees, the big tech companies, mainly, you know, West, West US that started all this. But they're going after something that is totally legitimate. I mean, they say the quality of patent is not high enough. And when they find prior art, of course, you know, then they have, they have a case. And, you know, I think that if, if, if that's the argument of saying, you know, only essential patents should be licensed, I think that's, that's true, right? Um, for me still, I, I think often if you have license negotiations, um, does it really matter if a few patents are not really valid or essential? I mean, we know from larger corporations that are in the SCP world, they own at least a few SCPs. And there it's just a matter of how valuable the technology is. Um, I think, you know, everyone has their players and businesses around this to, to make their case. And um, I think it's in that case, if you feel that it's difficult, you know, in the U.S. now with the system, then it's more a regulatory question, right? Is it too easy to file a PTAP and to, to, to you know, to show that patents are invalid? Is that maybe too easy on their end? I don't know that. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm just saying. Um, but running a business around it, I guess, is 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 their right to do it. Um, I, I, I'm for me, it's always important if the arguments make sense, right? And um, you know, you can al always argue both ways. Um, they have their own patent pool now, right? I mean, they 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 license patents now, so you know, they even commercialize IP. So you know, they are they're also in that business. So I think the, <laughs> I think it's a it's a complex world, and and everyone is playing their different roles. That's what I was kind of getting at. Let's say uh, Innovator has a portfolio of thousands of patents. The fact that somebody successfully challenges, you know, one of them, you know, that just increases the transaction costs of the Innovator, <laughs> eventually the implementer, really, and then the consumer down the line, but doesn't really prove anything. Is it going to kind of say, is, uh, tell the Innovator, oh, yeah, you're right, we're charging way too much for our pen portfolio in the licensing. Right. I mean, and I think the re you see that also. What kind of patents are unified in validating? It's most of the times patents from smaller non-practicing entities, right? So they say they, and of course for them it matters. If you have 10 patents and you cut them in half, right, then it's, it's, it's a big deal. Or maybe you kill all of them maybe eventually, right? And, and I think, but... I haven't seen Unified going after Qualcomm and trying to kill their portfolio because it's just too big. It's too, and it has a high quality. So, you know, they, and, and that's exactly the thing. I mean, you're right. I mean, going back and forth about invalidity and essential patents is, is in, in some ways, the technical part of the discussion with large portfolios is always a bit, you know, funny. I, I, I'm, I agree to that. But on the other hand, of course, some prove that you have something essential, you know, should be there. You know, there's the other side. You said, you know, like, just because you're an innovator doesn't mean you have to participate in these standard bodies. And it seems some, quote, unquote, innovators are trying to take advantage of that, right? They uh, have business models surrounding of, at least the way I understand it, is trying to guess what will be in, this, in the standards and then hopefully licensing those portfolios. Is that a problem? Is that a problem that they're not truly innovating? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> It, it's a good question. I mean, um, the question is how, you know, how that innovation is then used and consumed, right? I mean, it's, it's an interesting, uh, you know, it's an interesting new phenomenon. I don't, I don't know how big it will be that someone who's not even participating in standards development gets to a whole of central patents that of course can happen. I mean, per se, you can innovate. And if that, if the standard is, you know, in a way touching your invented invention, then that's your IP, right? Um, but in the end, of course, it's not the business model's fault. Um, maybe then we have to think about how broadly written we should allow claims in certain spaces or, you know, then it's a policy issue again. So I, I think everyone who is opening a legit legitimate business and who is innovating and getting returns on that, you know, is that's, that's, that's fair. Um, and, you know... I, you know, I think if someone is innovating and getting patents for it and, you know, they license those, it's, it's, they innovate, right? They create something. So they have, they have, you know, they have their right to exist. You mentioned actually in, in the very beginning that you'd go to these conferences and there are lobbyists from both sides making all kinds of arguments. And uh, we mentioned some of them about innovators versus implementers, hold out, hold up, transparency, royalty stacking. If, if you follow the standard central plan world friend, 
and they all have these clever arguments. What is your take? Do they really care about it, or are they trying to just find some talking points to push it one way or the other? I mean, it's it, it's, always, it's a good question. I think if you talk to him bilaterally, everyone is super smart and has very good arguments. But at some conferences that are public, where they know they they're heard by many others, of course they have their stories, right? And some are some use very simplistic, you know. Um, examples, you know, like um, it only cost a car wash or um, look at this um, uh, connectivity box. It's it's so small. Why, you know, why should we charge so much? So I think both sides have bring up examples that to me, at least as an economist, don't make sense. And, and you know, you shouldn't use those because they're just, you know, um, um, not good for a more professional discussion. Um, but I guess it's it's very emotional, that industry. And um, lobbyists in particular are very emotional, um, both sides, right? And um, even for us as a company, we've been in the middle of everything because some liked our reports and others hated our reports. And then they pushed us to be implementer friendly and they pushed us to be SEP owner friendly. And right now, for example, we're, we're, we're involved in a study for the European Commission and we're providing the data and analysis for that. And you know, I can tell you again, with people knowing about the study and lobbyists calling us, it's always the same, right? They they keep saying, you know, we should make sure that this and that is in there and others say, and then sometimes it's about semantics of how you phrase something, right? It's at that level of detail. So it's, you know, um, yeah, it's 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 emotional, I, I would say, and it, because there's so much at stake, um, you know, it's... It's a lot of transaction costs, to put it that way. <laughs> it's a lot of um, discussions, but often also good discussions. I think there are very, very, very many smart people also in there, leaving some of the, you know, some of the lobbyist work aside. You mentioned you getting caught up in controversies. I, I think one of the controversies that iPolitics got caught up in was you released some report about, you know, who are the top standard essential patent holders, and then that's an argument. Quantity does not equal quality. You mentioned about educating about the limitations of data as well. Can you talk about that? Because these are huge portfolios. How do you evaluate quantity on that scope? How to, or sorry, quality, obviously. <laughs> or, I, I think, I think the, the whole issue about it, we, we have published reports um, where we did not, oh, we typically in all reports, we never apply any valuation, right? We just count patents as simple as oh, patent families, right? So anyone who declares a patent, we count it as one, as one family. And um, those reports at some point when the discussion was heated, um, got picked up by major newspapers like the Wall Street Journal or The Economist or CNN or Bloomberg. And they, of course, simplified the whole story. And correct me if I'm wrong, they were trying to say, well, implementer lobby was Oh, you know, the Chinese companies get, are getting all the patents. We should be careful what we wish for. In a way, I mean, it, it very well fit back then in the whole discussion of banning certain companies out of certain markets. And then they turn out to be, you know, counting families wise, number one. And that fit in a great story for these new papers, newspapers, right? And they don't care about the details and they don't care about the truth in that sense, right? They take a study from us that got somehow popular and got viral, to put it that way. And then suddenly every licensing manager had this Wall Street Journal article and, you know, they were presented with that. And of course, that simplified, simplified the whole story. And then every, many people got upset. Um, which I understand, of course, simplifying in a very complex world a story. Same like with patent trolls, right? Also, a very emotional topic it was simplified by mass media and even politicians. And then it looked like it's a super bad, you know, business, which in the end, you know, some people still call, you know, certain companies like into digital, you know, patent troll just because they're not producing anything, but they are, you know, a very um, well-respected innovator in the industry. So I think that is the simplification of it was what, 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 what people, you know, kind of didn't like. And then, of course, when data is floating around, that is so public, then it's also cited in courts and, you know, and then they have to argue against it. So that's how we got into in between, you know, all of these. But I mean, it, we really we were on both sides and we we got attacked by both sides. Um, so we were always in the middle of it and we try to stay neutral and, you know, some of the also, the podcast or the webinars we do at 
is, is really also to try and to get a very open discussion running where we look at both sides and try to shed light on both arguments and see what people have to say. Part of the problem is that data is very compelling, right? If you can put numbers to tell a story, it's much more compelling than just making an argument without that. Lobbyists that I, I talked about on my podcast, and they, they cite some academic who I know did a study for them <laughs> to prove their point. And I know there's other studies, you know, kind of disproving it. It's a very useful tool, you know, when you're communicating with policymakers who this might be the first time they're hearing about this. I mean, these are numbers. How can you argue that? Exactly. And they have been cited. They, they even published in The Economist, right? How can you go against it? And I, I can see that, right? I mean, and we have to be careful. We also stopped, you know, publishing many rankings or that kind of things to kind of like not, you know, it's for us, it's really, it was marketing. It was getting our brand name out. You know, we didn't care who's first or second, right? We've never been, no one ever commissioned us to write a report. People tried after that, but we never did that because we wanted to sell software. Um, I think that the, the main difficulties with that data is that the share of actually essential patents from those declarations has also been decreasing over time. Um, some people say it's as low as 10%. And if you think that empirically as an economist, the lower the rate of actual essential patents, the higher is the likelihood that certain portfolio have a higher share and others have a lower share of essentiality. Because the whole problem only comes up when you say, I mean, it doesn't matter how many of the declared patents are essential or not if everyone has the same share of non-essentials, right? If everyone has, you know, only, let's say, 15 or 20% essential patents in their portfolio, but it's evenly distributed, then it doesn't matter if you have 2,000 patents or 400, right? It, it doesn't matter. Your share in the market remains the same. But the lower the rate of really essential patents, the higher the likelihood that there are actually differences in the declaration behavior. We also see that, right? Some people really claim chart before they declare, and others don't. I mean, most of the big ones don't do it. It's almost impossible to do claim chart every application before you declare it. And it's also not the practice that is requested there. But um, some of the smaller players really mostly claim chart and then they declare. And of course, they may have a much higher share than others. And, and that's important because in terms of their contribution to the standard, right? That's the whatever rate they get for licensing. Right. I mean, it shows, you know, how many patents they have in, you know, if you think about 5G, for example, you, you own like 10% of all 5G patents or 5%. It makes a big difference, of course. And we're talking about hundreds and thousands, millions of royalties. So, you know, that difference is, is you know, considerable. And, of course, then if you only count patent families, that, you know, those numbers may look not, you know, for some they look good, for others not, right? iPolitics is now acquired by LexisNexis. Can you tell us about that? What is the plan going forward for iPolitics? Yeah, I mean, many people ask me why we sold the company and that kind of thing. I think once you agreed to have venture capitalists in your company, you basically sign on, I will sell that company at some point. No one is investing in a stable business that is growing, right? I mean, everyone, a venture capitalist wants to sell. Um, and actually, LexisNexis, we had... We were in contact with them for over three years almost. Um, they saw us very early on. They kept contact. Um, and of course, we also talked to many others over the years. Um, but we are happy to, to um, you now you know, have their deal. I think um, everyone in our shareholder group was happy now to sell at that particular moment in time. You always have to also find the right moment when the company is big enough to sell. Um, I think that for, for us, one of the main reasons is LexisNexis is known as being one of the largest patent database providers in the world. We concentrate on SAPs and standards, but you know, providing all the information from all these different jurisdictions um, and patent offices was not always the strong, strongest part of our software. So that's for us, that's great to now partner with a company that is world champion in that. Um, and of course, they are, they are used to sell IP analytics software worldwide, right? And much more professional than we do. I think we did a great job with marketing and thought leadership, but selling professionally in the world, uh, in all the different countries and territories, I think partnering with them on this is, is also great. And of course, they also ha have many tools that are you know, successful and much bigger in terms of revenue like IP analytics is learning from that success on what kind of features and what kind of problems they solve and successfully did. I think that's, that there's a lot of excitement um, 
on our end to, you know, see and learn from that and make IP analytics better and, you know, grow further and make it bigger in the market. And I think we found a good partner with that. It was like uh, the beginning of a journey, an exciting journey ahead. All right. So I want to talk about the podcast. Uh, I'm just curious, how did you come up with the name, the SCP Couch? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we brainstormed with our marketing people back then. And um, we kind of had in mind something like um, a late night show, right? Where, you know, typically the anchor is sitting at a desk and then someone is sitting on the sofa next to him. And we have in our office, you cannot see this here, but we have this couch oh. that is the picture <laughs> It's here. And we thought, cool, you know, we have many people visiting us here in Berlin. So every time someone is there, you, you're going to interview that person. But obviously, doing COVID, yeah. <laughs> impossible. Um, so it remained a virtual couch, yet no one, I, yet was not able to really have someone next to me. So that's the first podcast episode where I can really, you know, interview someone on that actual SCP couch that is here in the office. Um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll have to see who that will be. But I hope uh, we'll manage to have someone here because traveling is possible now. You know, I guess shouldn't be an issue anymore. The couch kind of uh, invokes this image of people getting comfortable, right? And kind of speaking about what's around their mind. As, as you mentioned, you know, these conferences, people come with their, their agendas. I'm sure we come to your podcast with uh, similar agendas. I mean, how do you uh, think about, I guess, has anything surprised you by doing this podcast? Yeah, of course, I'm trying to push and also try to get information out of people that are, you know, critical and to have to hear something new. Obviously, we don't want to repeat ourselves from conferences and any other things that are anyways public. And that is, of course, always a challenge in a podcast to kind of tickle that out of people. However, in our case, so often I can tell you the podcast recording is then sent to the legal department and they have to approve it. And we had to cut a couple of times, not because someone was stuttering or there was weird pauses in there because they said something they couldn't say publicly. So it's still kind of difficult in our space to do that kind of podcast. But I mean, also to get, you know, something sometimes also about even though information is public to kind of get the dots together to really understand what it means, right? And interpreting it and getting some ideas from the people and their opinions on this. Um, I get even people tell, keep telling me um, on conferences that, you know, they entered licensing negotiations and they didn't know the other person. And they saw they, that person was speaking at the podcast and to get to know the person and to kind of estimate what that person is kind, like, is it a technical person, a legal person, right? To get get to know your opponent, put it that way, they were listening into that. So it was useful to them. Um, so maybe even at some point it's going to be in court, like someone's quoted, but that's exactly what people want to avoid, right? Don't be quoted in a podcast in court. And that's not my attention either, right? I mean, that's I'm telling everyone, you have the right to send it to your legal department before we publish it. That's your right. But yeah, I mean, learning something um, and, and, and educating the people. And I think especially with new industries, you know, um, that are now dealing with the whole world of SEPs, there's a lot of info that they can learn from, right? That they may not know. And we can, in the podcast, maybe put it in more simple words, I hope. Is there any ones that kind of stand out to you? Uh, any favorite episodes that you kind of would recommend people start with? Well, that's so hard to tell. Of course, the first ones are always the ones that I remembered most. Like, um, and I think the the one I can tell you, I mean, those stats are not public. The 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 one that most people listened to was the one with Luke McLeary very early on 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 the Vancey. And his ideas, I think that's the most popular one. And um, that was, I think, the second or the first episode that I, I, I did. Um, and I think it's, it's you never know when you start a podcast if it's going to be a success and if people like it and if you're good at podcasting and if the people that you interview are. And I think Luke is a great guy to interview. He, any question you ask him, he has a great answer and he can explain things simply in simple words that are complex. So I, I would say that was, for me at least, the, the episode where I thought, okay, this could really work. People could really like it. And, and it's going to be a podcast people were listening to. Those are great qualities in our podcast guests. So one last question is, uh, is there anything else, I guess, that you would like the listeners of Clause 8 to know about iPolitics, about your podcast, the SCP world, about Berlin, any kind of words of wisdom? Oh, yeah. 
I mean, Berlin, Berlin is not an IP city, but um, I can tell you when we published that EU study that I was just talking about on the SEP impact assessment, I want to do the presentation of that study in Berlin. So everyone who is interested is here with, welcome to visit. Visit us in the office. We will have a nice evening before that and then have a nice conference, I hope, around that. And I think around the topic of SEPs and IPLytics, Eli, you asked me, everything. There's not much to add. I think it was a great interview. Great questions. Good questions. Um, and yeah, I, I was really happy to be here. Thank you so much for uh, joining the Closet Podcast. And uh, hopefully one day I can visit you in Berlin. Thank you, Eli. Thank you for listening to Closet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others and leave a five-star rating. I'd also like to thank my firm, Herdy and Herdy LLP for their generous support. Clause 8 is produced by Great Feeling Studios and Brick Brewer. For more information, visit voiceofip.com. Thanks for listening.